and has joined, uh, joined our medical staff. Today, he's part of a thriving practice and one of a handful of physicians specially trained on the Da Vinci surgical system, a sophisticated robotic platform designed to enable complex surgery using a minimally invasive approach, and that's a mouthful. Here to discuss prostate health and treatment options, with Dr. Grinberg Kness. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, really glad to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces. It's good to see you all. Um, I can definitely say we've had some fantastic successes of good screening program and good prostate cancer treatment strategies right here in this room today. And I'm glad to be here because we've had a lot of controversy lately about prostate cancer, prostate cancer screening. Uh, we know that there's been a recent government committee made recommendations about how we should screen, whether we should screen, whether we should or we shouldn't, and who should get screened. And I hope that hopefully today we'll clear up the questions concerning that. Um, my background and my training, uh, I also went to graduate school. I did some training in uh, molecular genetics and uh, anti-tumor compound. Uh, Compounds that are used in treatment of all kinds of cancers, uh, specifically actually testicular cancer. My training in, uh, at the University of Cincinnati was in cancer and oncology, mostly in prostate cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and testicle cancer, and also a little bit more focus on impotence. Uh, been here now for 21 years plus. Glad to be here today, and hopefully today's talk will be able to save some lives. I want to thank the foundation for having us. Uh, I want to thank the two of the surgical. We're already set. There you go. And I want to thank the NFL for helping us to promote prostate cancer awareness because I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure, it'll save lives despite what the government wants to do. So, today we're going to talk about prostate cancer awareness. And at the end of the talk, towards the end of the talk, I'll talk about minimally invasive therapy, uh, ways that we take care of prostate cancer, typically through laparoscopic surgery and using the robot. So, what's the prostate? What is prostate cancer? How common is it? What are the risks? What are the symptoms? Who should be screened and warned? Which is a big controversy nowadays. How do we diagnose prostate cancer? And once we make the diagnosis, what are the treatment options, if any? Does everybody need to, be, need to be treated? First of all, let's talk about the prostate. The prostate is a male accessory sex organ. The primary organ, as all men know, is what the levitra and Viagra works for, okay? The secondary sex organ are the organs that help allow uh, uh, fertility and uh, an individual to become pregnant. And the prostate sits right below the bladder. This is the prostate gland. The urethra goes right through the middle of the prostate. That's why oftentimes in benign disease, benign disease, the prostate can become enlarged. It can squeeze the urethra and cause prostate obstructive symptoms, which is what we hear about. <laughs> These symptoms of prostate obstructive symptoms sometimes can be symptoms of prostate cancer, but not all that commonly and rarely. <clears throat> now, what's a prostate cancer? This is a normal prostate. This represents a prostate cancer with, with cancer cells. A cancer cell, with a, a prostate cancer cell, whether it's a breast cancer cell, colon cancer cell, they're cells that are growing out of control. Normal cells, when they grow, Cells have membranes, and when the membranes touch, it's called contact inhibition. When you have this contact inhibition, there's a DNA signal that says no more division. So when we mature, and we mature as individuals, all our organs, whether it be the heart, whether it be the kidneys, whether it be the prostate, or any other organ that we may have, the lungs, it gets to a certain point of maturity and it stops. The only organ that doesn't stop like that and can grow and regenerate is actually the liver. And the liver, which is why we can transplant portions of the liver. You can actually remove half the liver and give it to someone, and that <coughs> liver will actually regenerate. No other organ can do that. But when you have cancer cells, you lose the contact inhibition. These cancer cells then have proteins that, that break through membranes. It breaks into blood vessels. It breaks into lymphatics. and not only spreads locally as it grows, because that contact inhibition is lost, but it can also spread distantly all throughout the body through the blood vessels and lymphatics and the veins. Yeah, here's a little question. When we talk about breast cancer all the time, everybody has a little pink stuff, little ribbons. But when it comes to prostate cancer, how many men in America are affected by prostate cancer? One in three? One in six? One in 12? One in 24? How common is this disease? It's very common. About one in six men have prostate cancer in their lifetime. Look around this room, count the men, so one, two, three, four, five, prostate cancer. 
One, two, three, four, five. But our educational programs for lung cancer is very good now. So the smoking incidence is going way, way down. As the smoking incidence goes down, we're going to live longer. And as we live longer, the incidence of prostate cancer will go up. And as we live longer, more and more people will develop prostate cancer. And in the old days, when we did these studies in the 1960s in the VA, where we had a, a captive population of individuals, we were able to follow them for years and years because of the VA system. We used to think, well, people die with prostate cancer, not from prostate cancer. Does anybody know a vet from World War II that didn't smoke? Anybody? I mean, if you didn't smoke, you were a sissy. Everybody in the VA smoked, and they died from heart disease and lung cancer. So they never lived long enough for that prostate cancer to become significant to them and to kill them. Those are old studies. They're old studies. They really don't apply anymore. Every 2.4 minutes, a man is diagnosed with prostate cancer. Every 60 minutes, a man dies from prostate cancer. If we're here for two hours while we're sitting here talking, eight men in this country will die from prostate cancer. I want that government panel to look at these people in the eye and say, you're a statistic. You know, you shouldn't be dying. I mean, you're just a statistic. Sorry, you blew it. It's wrong. So, what are the stats? Aside from non-melanoma skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, I mean, everybody goes to Florida, everybody's out in the sun. Everybody gets skin cancers left and right, you take them off, so it's a very, very common cancer. But prostate cancer is the second most leading cancer as a cause of death and the most common cancer overall in men. Most of the most recent data we have is from 2007. In that year, we had 223,000 men, over 223,000 men diagnosed with prostate cancer, almost 30,000 prostate cancer deaths. This covers approximately 99% of the population in the United States. What are the trends? From 1998 to 2007, deaths in prostate cancer have decreased significantly by 3.9% overall for men. This might not seem to be a big number, but 3.9% of 224,000 is about 10,000 people. That's a, that's a lot of people that we're saving. By different, uh, by different uh, ethnicity, 3.8%. For white men, 4.2% for black men, 3.8% for Hispanics. Haven't really done much for the American Indians, but that's good for them, so things aren't really that bad. 3.1% per year for Asians and uh, Pacific Islander men. These are mortality trends from the, uh, from the CDC. Now, National Cancer Institutes, the survival epidemiology and end results data, which is the data that we as urologists use quite commonly. We now have statistics for 2008, and we can predict it to 2011. The death rate and the overall rate of prostate cancer incidence is going to go up. Instead of 224,000 like we had in 2007, 241,000 men will be diagnosed, and almost 34,000 will die from prostate cancer. Now, some people might say, like the government panel that says prostate cancer screening doesn't, doesn't apply because we're not really doing anything to decrease the death rate. We are. We are, but as people live longer, we're going to have a higher instance because we're going to diagnose more tumors. As we diagnose more tumors, some will not be curable. In fact, if some people listen to that panel, they're not going to show up, and they're going to show up too late, and we're not going to be able to save them. Screening saves lives, and your being here is probably going to save someone's life tonight. Now, what are the risk factors for prostate cancer? We always think that prostate cancer is a disease of the elderly. It's not true. It's not true, and I'm glad to see that we've got a good variety of all ages here. Because I'm going to tell you right now that 75% of prostate cancers are diagnosed in men less than 74 years old. And nowadays, if you don't have heart disease, if you don't have lung disease, if you're not a smoker, and you're 74 years old, you've got an excellent chance of living 10 to 15 years with a fairly good quality of life. So it's not a disease of the elderly. It's a disease of all men. Age is important. Family history is important. The reason why family history is important is just like breast cancer. There's a breast cancer gene, there's a prostate cancer gene. You want to know if anybody in your family has prostate cancer, your father, brothers, and your children, 
it's important to know who in the families have prostate cancer because if you've had three family relatives, direct blood relatives, who have had prostate cancer, your chances are over 90% you have that prostate cancer gene. And if you have that prostate cancer gene, you want to make sure that your children know to get screened to get evaluated because it would be a disaster for them not to know and to not be diagnosed early with localized prostate cancer when it's still curable. Race is important. African American men are twice more likely to die from prostate cancer than our white males. Other things are important with prostate cancer. Just with any cancer, every single cancer, the incidence of every single cancer out there is increased by smoking. I can't be more clear than saying that smoking kills, and it does, doesn't kill from lung cancer, it doesn't kill from heart disease, but it increases the risk of prostate cancer, <clears throat> increases the risk of breast cancer, increases the risk of colon cancer, increases the risk of lymphoma. Every cancer out there, the data is out there, and what it does is it increases the risk of cancer by reducing the ability of your immune system to fight cancer. And our immune systems are very important. Immune, our immune systems kill cancer cells all the time. We may not think about this, but we've got mutations occurring all the time in our bodies. And these mutations are often cleaned up by our immune system because they find that these cells aren't normal. They, got white cells, they phagotize them, uh, and they eat them, and, and they become metabolized. But when that immune system isn't working correctly, your chances of cancer go away. People have had diets, individuals who don't watch their cholesterol. There's no doubt that fatty diets also increase the risk of prostate cancer. We've had studies to see if there's things that can decrease the risk of prostate cancer, such as vitamin E. We had a study called the SELECT study. I can't tell you what the, what the letters stand for. I forget there's so many letters between S E E R, capture, select. But we found it, we actually stopped the study after a while because we found it really didn't make any difference. On the other hand, selenium could make a difference. Selenium may actually, uh, may actually help uh, to prevent prostate cancer. And red tomato skins. Leo, what's this stuff? Lycopenes. Lycopenes. So, you know, if you like your red wines, that's good for the heart. Eat some red tomatoes. Make sure you get plenty of meprazole so you don't get heartburn. But it's going to help you with prostate cancer. Now, what are the possible symptoms of prostate cancer? Trouble urinating, weak flow, frequency urination at night, painful burning, blood in the urine or semen, pain in the back or hips, painful ejaculation. If you have any of these things, I go to church and say a prayer because it's too late. It's too late. These are symptoms, all symptoms typically of advanced prostate cancer. And if you wait until you have these symptoms, we're going to palliate you. We're going to keep you alive for a while and try to keep you as comfortable as we can, but we're not going to be able to save your life. But if you got trouble urinating, weak flow, get your prostate checked. Well, we have a little bit of fluid which is retained underneath the skin. If I skinned anybody here, and don't worry, I don't know plans on doing that. But if we took the skin and spread you out, you'd have probably about two square meters of skin. If you just took a little bit of fluid underneath that skin, that winds up to be probably about a couple of quarts a day. If the heart doesn't work well enough and that fluid <coughs> escapes out through the blood vessels and underneath the skin, it doesn't get picked up by the lymphatics and get back into the bloodstream until you lay down flat and gravity isn't affecting you. And so that's very, very common. And until you lay down at night, you might not go frequently during the day, but all of a sudden you're giving yourself a drink. You're not feeling it because you're not thirsty, but you're giving your, your vascular system a drink at night when you lay down and you're going to start going to the bathroom. So if you want to do something about that and you want to try to improve your nocturia, you're getting up at night. If you eat, you eat about 6 o'clock, let your food settle down for about two hours, then about an hour or two before you go to sleep, lay down flat, put your legs up, have your head up uh, in a pillow, and in about 15 or 20 minutes, you're going to start going to the back. Now, you might fall asleep on the couch, but it's better to fall asleep on the couch and go to bed and be up every half an hour, every, every hour or so going to the bathroom. Pain in the back, hips or pelvis that won't go away. Well, gee, this is about 50% of the patients in my office, I think. 
Um, I got people that have, uh, you know, kidney pain. Of course, it's not their kidneys, it's back pain. And, uh, back pain is probably one of the most common symptoms we have in this country. Just because you have back pain doesn't mean you have prostate cancer, and just because you have back pain doesn't mean you have kidney pain. Chances are you got back pain and it's arthritis. We work very hard in this nation. Um, painful burning or urination, you got prostatitis. Chances are you have a prostate infection. There's women here, I'm sure women have had a few urinary tract infections in their lives in the past, and it hurts when you go. It burns. When we as men have it, it's not a urinary tract infection, it's a prostate infection. And that is actually very, very serious, and it needs to be addressed. But if you have painful burning on urination, they're also going to have hematuria, or blood in the urine, when you have prostate cancer. And that means the cancer is already spreading up into the bladder and spread beyond the prostate. And you're really in dire straits right there. Painful ejaculation, also more consistent with prostatitis, not necessarily prostate cancer. Now, again, if you don't have symptoms, you don't have cancer. Well, by the time you have symptoms, it's too late. We want to find you before you have symptoms. Because if you have localized prostate cancer, you have no idea it's there. And thank God for the PSA test, because in the days where I used to train at the VA back in the 1980s, when I did my initial training, the only way we had to find prostate cancer is finding a cancer with our finger exam. We had a test called prostatic acid phosphatase. By the time that test went up, over 50% of the patients had cancer already in their bones. So we were only able to find the prostate cancers mostly to tell them, yep, you've got prostate cancer, we'll try to take care of you. We'll cut off your testicles, but you're going to be dead within five years. And I can give much better news to my patients now, because right now we have find patients with localized prostate cancer. 99% of the time we're successful in curing those cancers. One of the reasons why I went into urology, it's a great deal. We actually cure cancer. Now, what's the AUA's recommendation? It's the American Urologic Association. It's important that everyone talk to their doctor about prostate cancer screening. Now, prostate cancer screening doesn't mean that we're going to get a PSA, we're going to stick you in there, do a biopsy, stick you with needles, rip out your prostate. Prostate cancer screening means we're going to sit down, we're going to talk, we're going to see what your risk factors are, we're going to see what your family history is, we're going to see what your long-term survival is. Because medicine is not a cookie cutter. Everyone in this room, we've got men, we've got women, but every man, every woman is different. We all have different histories. Not everybody is created. Not going to offend Dr. Brastein. There's always people that are out there and will think that, you know, they're better because it's, you know, the brass is green or elsewhere. We all put our, our pants on the same way. Okay? We all go by the same guidelines. We all go by the same recommendations here at the American Neurological Association. But what I don't want to happen is for me to treat a patient and for there, for there to be some kind of problem, which can happen with any kind of surgery. And believe me, I take care of a lot of problens that happen down in Memorial Sloan Kettering and and happen at Beth Israel or whatever, and they can wind up coming back to Plattsburgh and we take care of them because they're my patients. But I wouldn't want anybody to second guess to think, gee, I could have done better if I went elsewhere. So I'd always want my patient to feel more comfortable. If they feel they can go somewhere else and get treated better, then that's perfectly fine. We're here with open arms when they get back. Now, why do we want to go ahead and identify things early? We talk about, we talk about screening at age 40. Just because we screen at age 40 doesn't mean that 
every year we're going to be getting a PSA, or every year we're going to be getting other blood work, or we're going to be getting scans or anything like that. But we know that prostate cancer is curable when it's localized. And that's why it's very, very important for us to identify things early, because we don't make a diagnosis all at once. If we find something abnormal in the digital rectal exam, what we call the DRE, and you'll see this PSA and DR. PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's a protein that's made only by the prostate, um, and it is very specific to the prostate gland. If you don't have a prostate, you don't have any PSA. And so as far as that being a marker for benign disease or for cancer, it's a very good marker. And the digital rectal exam is extremely important because the digital rectal exam sometimes is able to find cancers that the PSA can't. And I will tell you, in my experience, 10% of the individuals that I treat for prostate cancer, and there's one sitting right here in this room, I found on digital rectal exam, the patient had a PSA of only 0.5. And that's very, very common. I see that all the time. But if we, make, if we start to screen the patient early, what it allows us to do is not jump into making a treatment decision. If we feel a digital rectal exam is a little bit unusual, not that it feels terribly abnormal, but we'll say, look, you know, why don't we go ahead and see what happens in the next three months, for the next six months. A PSA does not make a diagnosis of prostate cancer. A biopsy makes a diagnosis of prostate cancer. That's what this commission doesn't understand. We don't make a diagnosis of prostate cancer with PSA. PSA is just part of the tools, one of the tools that we use in order to make that diagnosis. We may get a PSA in an individual that's eight, 10, maybe even 15, and it raises a red flag. But it doesn't mean we're going to go in there and remove the patient's prostate, treat them for prostate cancer, because that PSA may be simply from infection or prostatic enlargement, or they may have mowed their two acres bouncing up and down in that mold, and that'll raise PSAs. Or they may have had a wild night with their wives the night before, and that'll do it too. Anyway, so. We go ahead and we find prostate cancer early. The cure rate's nearly 100%. We're not doing this thing right. What happened? You just clicked off. Yeah, you just moved the mouse. That's all right. You just, you're good. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. They're ready. Now, screening test. What screening test we use? I just mentioned PSA, prostate specific antigen, DRE, digital rectal examination. We only order biopsies, and, and I will agree that years ago we were a lot more lenient about getting biopsies. I don't think our practice was actually. We, we've got a fairly, I don't want to tatter our horn, but we've got a very good prostate cancer diagnosis rate, which is 50% or greater. In our practice, if you're going to get a biopsy, we're very suspicious there's a cancer because we're only going to biopsy if we really think there is a cancer. Biopsies do carry complications. Biopsies can cause bleeding, can cause discomfort. There's some data that shows that biopsies are done recurrent multiple biopsies over time can cause some erectile dysfunction. I haven't seen that in my patients. But worst of all, nowadays, biopsies can cause significant infections. Not too long ago, I'd say probably five or ten years ago, we did biopsies very comfortably because we had very, very good antibiotics that took care of the bacteria that typically are in the rectum. The biopsies are actually done through the rectum into the prostate. We prep the patient. Patients have to have enemas beforehand, and they have to be on antibiotics beforehand to make sure they're circulating antibiotics before we do these biopsies. Unfortunately, and this is a problem with the medical community, and you guys are responsible too, because when you guys go to the doctor and you say, I want something for my infection, that doctor probably wants to go back to sleep and says, fine, I'll give me an antibiotic. It's the wrong thing to do. It's the wrong thing to do. And maybe some of the women out here, when you call your doctor, you say, I have a urinary tract infection, give me an antibiotic. And the doctor says, well, wait and see what the culture says. <laughs> I'll tell you, in my practice, 50% of the women that think they have urinary tract infections don't. And so we're giving antibiotics out there to the public, and they're taking antibiotics sometimes like it's candy. And unfortunately, these antibiotics then cause resistance and strains. And that's what's happened over time with the antibiotics that we typically use for prostate biopsies, is that we've got more and more resistance. And whereas before, we could be very, very comfortable with the antibiotics that we gave our patients, feeling comfortable that they really wouldn't have the complication of significant infections. They now have infections because we've got organisms in the community, before this, just in the hospitals, but in the community now that are very resistant to, organ to antibiotics that we can give a work. And typically, unfortunately, in our practice, we probably have three or four patients between the three doctors that will 
have a problem with a biopsy and need to be get admitted to the hospital, they have an intravenous antibiotic. So we don't do antibiotics. I mean, we don't do prostate biopsies very, very easily. Before we go for a biopsy, we want to be relatively sure that we're doing it for the right reason. And now more than ever, and I'm sure many of you out there are Plavix, Coumadin, let's see, Pradaxa, because we used to do open heart surgery left and right. Open heart surgery is becoming a thing of the past. Everybody's got stents. I mean, I'm sure if I asked how many people out there in the audience have stents, and individuals that are 60 or older, I'm sure 50% of you probably have stents. You don't have to raise your hands. But, but the problem with the stents are that many of these stents are called drug-eluting stents. And if you're not put on blood thinners, then those stents can become obstructive. Well, we go and stick uh, 12 needles in the prostate, and you're on a blood thinner, you're going to bleed like a stuffed pig. So we have to take a chance of getting you off these blood thinners in order to do the biopsies. The cardiologists are fantastic, and I actually saw them open up a blood vessel in one of my patients the other day after surgery. And, it, and it's actually an amazing thing to watch. Even as a physician, it was an amazing thing to watch, and it saved my patient's life who had to come off the blood thinner so I could do an operation. And he developed a blood clot. But unfortunately, we cannot do these biopsies while you're on blood thinners because you will bleed. So we have to take risks, and it now becomes a much, much more risky thing. So biopsies are ordered after evaluating the screening results and personal risk factors, such as is the patient on blood thinners? If the patient was to have a prostate cancer, what's their survival overall? Do they have significant heart disease? Do they have lung disease? Are they on a ventilator? Are they respirator? Are they oxygen dependent? If I've got a patient that really doesn't have at least a five to 10 year survival, I'm not gonna be that aggressive in looking for prostate cancer regardless of what the PSA does. Because if I find a cancer and they're, I'm gonna treat them, but that treatment's gonna be worse than the cancer, I'm not gonna be that aggressive about it because they're gonna die from something else first. The one thing that luckily we have with prostate cancer, at least the well differentiated and the moderately differentiated, I'm going to show you that in a second, is that prostate cancer does tend to be a slow growing cancer, which allows us to be a lot more patient and wait before we make any decisions, whether we're going to do a biopsy or after the biopsy, whether we're going to go right to treatments. Now, let's get the PSA. I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox. Myth, high, pro high PSA means prostate cancer, low PSA means no cancer. It's not true. And I wish I could browbeat some of my <laughs> colleagues who do screening, not, not the urologists, I think the urologists understand this, but primary care physicians and family physicians, they get a PSA, but they don't want to stick a finger up somebody's butt, and I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I, I mean, I don't think there's one, well, there might be a few nowadays, but I don't think there's one patient who doesn't turn around to me when I'm about to go ahead and do a rectal exam and say, no, doc, I really don't like this. You know? You know look, I'm not making any judgments, but this, this isn't my favorite part of my day either. Uh, but you know, I find cancers by sticking my finger in people's butts. And, and not only do I find prostate cancers in people with normal PSAs, but I find rectal cancers. In my career here in the past uh, 21 years, I've found three rectal cancers by just looking for a prostate cancer. I can't be the only guy that should have done a rectal exam. I mean, somebody should have been doing a rectal exam on these patients. But I guess it always falls to the urologist. You know, you go to the internist, and they ask you, are you going to see a urologist? Yeah, well, I'll let him do the rectal exam. All right, that's fine. I don't mind. It's part of what we do. Right? Um, but PSA, having a high PSA doesn't mean you have cancer either. Because actually, PSA being produced by the prostate gland and only by the prostate gland, so many grams of prostate will produce so many grams of PSA. So the individuals with a big prostate will make more PSA. Individuals with a small prostate will make less PSA. The reason why we look for PSA and relate it to prostate cancer is that prostate cancer typically produces tenfold more PSA than benign disease does. And it also tends to go up more rapidly than benign disease does. So that's why it's so important that we get a baseline, that we know where we start, because then we can follow. And it's not the baseline PSA where we really make the diagnosis. It's watching that PSA rise when we really know it shouldn't be rising. That's the biggest red flag there is. And that's where PSA 
is a fantastic thing. Now, Dr. Grafton and I get patients, and Dr. Banco, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, we get patients all the time referred with high PSAs. Well, the first things we'll do, we'll say, well, what were you doing at the time? I mean, were you riding your mower? Or were, you, were you out riding a three-wheeler all afternoon? Were you on your snowmobile doing 200 miles? Because some of these things can raise the PSA. You know, so you might look inside the person's urine and realize that they've got white cells and bacteria, and they actually have prostatitis. But one of the first things I'll do is I'll typically repeat the PSA. Because PSA, like the committee, government committee says, can fluctuate. It can go up and down. You don't go just by one number. But that $60 test, whatever it costs, I think it's about $60, can be a lifesaver. And that $60 test, if you repeat it, goes back down, or it doesn't go back down and you do a biopsy, will save five years of a slow prostate cancer death, which will cause the system cost the system hundreds of thousands of dollars. So to save that $60 test, you got a patient that will be dying from prostate cancer maybe 10 years, five or 10 years, in and out of the hospital, in and out of the emergency room, tubes in their sides, resections of prostate cancer up in the bladder, inability to avoid, Foley catheters. These are the things that we have to deal with every time a person has progressive prostate cancer and we don't find it when it's local. And I know, speaking for Dr. Grass and Dr. Banco, we'd much rather cure the patient than keep the patient alive and unfortunately lose the patient in the long run. And I've never seen a patient who's dying from prostate cancer who will turn to me and say, gee, doc, I really wish I could have an erection now. It doesn't happen. People want to live. So let's get to the biopsy. I don't agree with this slide. Some of these slides are mine and some of these aren't, okay? But this says to confirm a diagnosis. I don't confirm a diagnosis with a biopsy. I make the diagnosis with a biopsy. We don't make a diagnosis with a finger exam. I don't make a diagnosis based on history or family history or PSA or PCA3 or PSA2. These are all different tests, part of our armamentarium that we can use to diagnose prostate cancer. But to diagnose prostate cancer, you got to do a biopsy. That's the only way. Now, a patient can come up to me and say, gee, doctor, are you sure that's right? I say, well, I'm not a pathologist, but I've got a very good pathologist, and I trust him, and he's never been wrong. But if you'd like to take it somewhere else, you can. You can get a second opinion on your pathology specimen. I don't know if your insurance plan or Medicare will cover that. But it's certainly within your rights. And if you're thinking about a very tough treatment decision, you may want to go ahead and get that done. But I will tell you, I, in my career, I've never had a diagnosis that's been wrong when that prostate's come out. Now, this is what prostate cancer looks like. <coughs> this is what we call grade one. Gleason, Dr. Gleason was a pathologist actually out from the Midwest. Before Dr. Gleason came up with a scoring system, it was very subjective. I mean, this guy over here would call it well differentiated. This guy over here would call it moderately well differentiated. This guy over here would call it poor. And it's very important to determine how serious the cancer is by the grading system because the higher the grade, the more aggressive it is, and the more likely it's going to kill. These glands, these little bubbles, are, are actually very, very small. And the reason why they're small, and they get smaller, and they could get very, very weird looking, is that when we have benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, the prostate grows, the cells grow, they get plump, but they don't divide. When you have cancer, you got DNA that's dividing, and the cells divide with the DNA. And so what happens is, rather than having large round glands, you got multiple small ones because they're dividing very rapidly. But this, no one's ever going to call this these days because we've got too much medical legal problems. This is a well differentiated tumor, Gleason's 1. I, I think I've only seen a Gleason's 1 twice in my career. Have you seen Gleason's 1? No, because if there's a doctor that calls this and somebody goes and treats a patient, the prostate's removed, the Gleason's 1 looks like regular prostate. Someone's going to get sued here. So either the pathologist is going to say this is definitely a cancer and even very few tubes. But well, probably well over 50% of the cancers are Gleason's 3. This is a moderately differentiated tumor. Now, you don't always have the same tumor throughout the prostate gland. They're mixed. They're mixed. And so the pathologist gives us a score. They'll say, okay, I'm looking, and there's a predominant pattern of a three or a predominant pattern of a four, but I also see a little bit of two, or I might see some five. And so it gives us 
two different grades. You just said a, a first grade and a second grade. It's like elementary school. Here's a, the first grade is very important because that's the predominant grade. The second grade is of the secondary importance. A Gleason's 3 plus 4 is not the same as a Gleason's 4 plus 3. A Gleason's 4 plus 3 is a very dangerous cancer. That's a cancer that will tend to progress and spread a lot more rapidly and right before our eyes. A Gleason's 3 plus 4 means most of it's mildly differentiated. There's a little bit of that inter interspersed. But if you have any 4 or 5, if there's any of this in any specimen, that's a significant cancer. That's a cancer that needs to be addressed. That's not a cancer that you'll find. We're going to talk about this later that we do active surveillance with. I'm going to take questions afterwards, so if you, uh, if you have any questions, just keep them under your hats for now, okay? Now, the other thing we do is we stage cancer. Just like the pathology is very, very important, the histology, for us to know how serious the cancer is, the staging is also very important. Because most of our cancers that we find now is called a T1. This is what's called the, the TNM staging system. We used to have a stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. But we find it's a lot more helpful to use what's called the TNM staging system. It's the American Joint Committee on Cancer has decided to do this. And it's now become an international system. T1 disease means it's totally localized. T2 disease. This actually is not correct. It should show a lump here. It means that I can actually feel a lump from the prostate. T3 disease means that the pro it's spreading either through the capsule of the prostate or up into the seminal vesicle. And T4 means it's actually spreading into surrounding organs, either into the rectum or up inside the bladder. Now, N stands for lymph nodes. Typically, when we'll stage patients, if all we have is T1 disease, that's all we're going to do. Because the likelihood of a person, unless you have very, very high-grade disease, the likelihood of a person having a cancer beyond the prostate gland, which has gone anywhere else with T1 disease, is less than 1%. It's very, very small. So all these CAT scans, all these bone scans, we're just wasting the government's money and your money and your time, and we're exposing unnecessary radiation. But if we have high-grade disease, if we've got Gleason's 8, 9, or 10, even if it's T1, we're going to go ahead and do a metastatic evaluation because that might change what we do. And the chances are much greater that there's going to be spread of cancer beyond localized disease. That's when those cancers might spread to the lymph nodes, where that end part of the TNM might be important, where we see some lymph nodes which are enlarged. And that sort of raises a red flag as to whether, which way we may want to treat the patient. M stands for metastasis. Metastasis doesn't mean lymph nodes. Metastasis means that the tumor has gone elsewhere to other organs, such as the liver, the lung, the brain, and the bone. Tumors tend to spread to areas that are very richly vascularized, that have very rich capillary beds, which are the brain, the liver, the lung, and the bone. Uh, the four stages of prostate cancer. Now, what are our goals in treating prostate cancer? We want to improve survival through cancer control. Now, it doesn't mean cure. Improve survival. There's some individuals that we want to achieve a cure because we know they're going to live for 15, 20, 25 years. There's some individuals, all we want to do is just control the cancer while maintaining the quality of life. It's very, very important. We want to preserve urinary, sexual, and bowel functions. And this is important because as a surgeon, I don't really have much problems with my patients having bowel problems. But if they get radiation, the bowels can have some problems. And we want to minimize the side effects whatever treatment we use. So, whenever we're deciding on how we're going to go ahead and treat patients, we want to look at the benefits of the treatment. In other words, do we really need to cure the patient? Or can we just sort of let the patient get along with their cancer, so as long as the cancer doesn't bother them? As opposed to the side effects of the treatment. Because if we do surgery, there's going to be a risk of incontinence. There's going to be a risk of impotence. There's a risk of bleeding. There's some problems after the operation, they might have to be admitted to the hospital where they get an ileus, and bowels fall asleep. They can be a prolonged hospitalization. Sometimes that happens. So we look at age and expected lifespan. We look at other health conditions. Like I said, we want to take a look at heart disease. As a person, do they, do they still have active angina? Um, do they have problems with their breathing? Do they need to be oxygen dependent? Very, very important. And then we want to take a look also, especially these patients with high-risk cancers, or higher stage cancers where we feel that 
some of the times may actually be understaging because these two T2 cancers where I can actually feel one third of the time those cancers are going to be understaged. They're actually going to be T3 tumors. And T3 tumors do not respond well to some treatment strategies. And so it's very, very important for us to consider all these things before we make a, a treatment plan decision. Now, so what are the different things we can do? Well, we've got active surveillance, radiation surgery, and then there's other treatments. With active surveillance, actually the American Urologic Association puts over to the side something called watchful waiting. I actually learned something from preparing for this talk. I, used to, I thought that watchful waiting was the same as active surveillance, and active surveillance took over. Watchful waiting means that we're going to accept an individual who's got cancer, and we're going to watch them with the cancer to make sure that the cancer doesn't cause any significant side effects or problems. We'll typically do that in the infirm elderly. And as long as they're comfortable, prostate cancer probably isn't going to kill them, especially if they're bedridden, they're in the nursing home, they have catheters, other things. We're not going to be very aggressive in those patients. So we'll watch those patients as long as it doesn't affect their quality of life, as long as it doesn't go to their bone, as long as it doesn't go to their backs, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, there's no risk of a back fracture, a hip fracture, a leg fracture. We'll watch these patients. That's watchful waiting. With active monitoring the prostate, active surveillance, individuals, some of these individuals are young, in their 50s, even in their 40s, where we find prostate cancer, but it may be moderately differentiated, or well differentiated, very low bulk tumor. And what we might do is just closely monitor the patient with PSA and digital rectal exam. Now, the PSA is a very good test, but what the PSA has done is it's allowed us to find prostate cancers much, much earlier than we need to, which makes it very hard for us as doctors. And it makes it also very hard for you as patients because we make a diagnosis probably 10, 15, 20 years before that prostate cancer may cause any problems. That's called lead time bias. Now, what that means is that I have to suffer as a doctor knowing that you've got a cancer and sometime that cancer may progress. And you have to suffer as an individual who has to live with that prostate cancer if you choose to do nothing about that for some time. Um, it's a tough thing, but we do active surveillance quite a bit now. I've got quite a few patients, as does Dr. Grabstein. So unlike what the commission says, that, that prostate cancer treatment can be very dangerous and harm patients, we don't treat everybody for prostate cancer. Oftentimes, we're willing to watch these patients, and we can, we can find when the cancer is going to progress. We're pretty good at it. When we find that that PSA starts to rise, or, some, or we feel something on digital rectal exam, or, or there's a change in the clinical status, then we say, OK, it's time to do something. It could be 15 years later. I've got, I've got two patients that have been now 15 years with prostate cancer. They're doing fine. Great sex lives, no incontinence. They're living with prostate cancer. We don't treat everybody with prostate cancer. Radiation therapy. Radiation, most people know you get the radiation from the outside. It tends to kill the cells. Cells go through a cell cycle. All cells aren't growing at the same time. And what radiation does is radiation affects the DNA of the cell, and they will die at different times in their cell cycle. On the other hand, not all cells are radiation sensitive. So there are going to be some people treated with radiation, quite a few people, who are not going to be treated effectively by the radiation because the radiation doesn't always work. Now, there's two ways of giving the radiation. You can do this with external beam radiation. And to their credit, the radiation oncologists have gotten very, very good. Uh, we used to have linear accelerators that were very, very dangerous burned a lot of tissue around the prostate. People had many problems with holes in their rectum, problems with their bladders uh, being dysfunctional. Um, and now we've got something called intensified modulated radiation therapy and conformal radiation therapy. Where planning is done with a CAT scan, the radiation actually goes around you, so the highest dose is delivered to the prostate and maybe to the surrounding areas, the sites and the lymph nodes, and they do a great job. The side effects that we had from radiation therapy in the past are not nearly that much right now. Um, and in some cases, they're actually very, very good indications to have radiation therapy. Surgery. We can remove the prostate. There are many ways to remove the prostate. We can remove the prostate through the belly. Remove the prostate through the perineum. It's taking the prostate out between the scrotum and the rectum. We can do it laparoscopically. We can do it open. We can do the robot. We've got all these different choices. And you'll find that if you're my patient, or Dr. Grafson's patient, we'll sit down with you 
and we'll go through all these different choices and tell you why there's advantages with ones versus the other. Not everybody is a candidate for every form of therapy for prostate cancer. We individualize it to the patient. Then there's other treatments. We can freeze the prostate. Stick it in the freezer. We can microwave it. Stick it in the microwave. Actually, of course we don't stick the prostate in the freezer, but we stick the freezer in the prostate. We actually have forms of freezing the prostate, which years ago, we've had these for years, and also we had microwave therapy for years. But we just haven't had good ways to go ahead and fine tune these things. So in years past, there were lots of complications. There were problems with the urethra. People couldn't pee. They had to have diversions, problems in the rectum. But nowadays, we've got such good imaging. We've got ways to protect the urethra by placing warming catheters. And we stick needles in the prostate. We're actually able to watch and form ice balls. And tissue, live tissue, cannot live through freezing. You cannot take out your steak, take out those cells, and grow those cells after you've frozen your steak. They're not going to live. You can't reculture those cells. By the same token, if you cook the prostate with a microwave, it's not going to live. The only problem is, is that sometimes, just like radiation therapy, we believe that we're treating the whole prostate gland, and some cells can survive. Just like radiation therapy, some cells will become will be resistant. On the other hand, the one thing about doing surgery is, you remove the prostate, it's out. So there is an advantage there. Okay, so why don't we take a look and compare all these different therapies. The prostate with surgery, we look at cumulative survival, where one is 100%, this 80%, that's 60%, and this is years out. Doing pretty well. After prostatectomy, it's twice the amount of survival compared to radiotherapy. Other therapies, such as cryoablation, hormonal therapy, active surveillance, and it's pretty good. Not bad, huh? You don't have to have anything done and you're going to live. This is, this fools you. This fools you, and I'll tell you why it fools you. Because we as urologists will choose what patient is best suited for which of these therapies, which of course will make, will, will, will create a bias as to what the survival is over time. The best patients, the best candidates, are going to get surgery. So we're going to have the best survival data with the patients that have surgery. The active surveillance patients, well, their cancers aren't that serious anyway. I mean, we can watch these patients, so of course they're going to live 10 years because we've made good decisions in following these patients. They don't need the surgery. They don't need any treatment to begin with. The patients that have radiation therapy, well, they're infirm. They don't... Um, you know, they've got lung disease, they've got heart disease, they don't have good immune systems, and radiation therapy, and we typically send the patients with the higher grade disease, the, the, the tumors which likely probably aren't going to work with surgery or anything, we send them to radiation therapy because we don't want to put a person through an operation when it's not going to work, or when they're going to have rapid recurrence afterwards. So things here are a little bit biased. Of course, the other therapies, the cryoablation, I believe in cryoablation, that if you've looked on TV, they've now got these ads that if anyone's interested in has prostate cancer, you can get into these HIFU, high intensity frequency ultrasound studies, um, because it's not approved by the FDA in this country. If you're going to have HIFU, you've got to go either to Canada, where they're going to charge you a lot of money, or to Ireland. Um, but what it is, in hormonal therapy, my gosh, hormonal therapy, we're really not going to use unless we use it together as adjuvant with radiation therapy, or hormonal therapy in individuals that aren't a candidate for any form of other therapy. So, of course, these people are going to do a lot worse. But, to be honest with you, if we took some of these patients, gave them radiation therapy, they'd do pretty good. There's probably about a 10 to 12% difference between the two, given the same disease and the same clinical status of the patient. I'm going to let you chime in here anywhere. Are you good? Fantastic job. Um, so, what's active surveillance? We're going to. For the American, I'm going to give you guys some websites, and ladies. I'm going to give you some websites at the end of the day. One of them is actually uh, the urologyhealth.org. That's the uh, website for patients of the American Urologic Association. I'm going to give you a, a little secret. You're probably making a mistake telling you this. But you can actually get on our professional website. You can go right to our guidelines and see the guidelines that are given to us by our head honchos in our field, so to speak. And they, they, have, they put a lot of work into these. I, I was reading this, and um, 
in order to come up with guideline policies for prostate cancer screening and treatment, they screened over 10,000 articles. And out of those 10,000 articles, they came down to 324 articles that they thought were valid and they could use. And out of those, they came down to maybe 60 more articles that they really used for the guidelines. A guideline is a standard. And a standard means that if you deviate from the standard, probably you're not practicing good medicine. I don't want anybody to start going looking through these and saying, well, I'm going to sue my doctor. But we will deviate from guidelines if we have a good reason to do that. But guidelines are fairly standard. So it doesn't matter whether you go to Plattsburgh, Burlington, Albany, Saratoga, Memorial Sloan Kettering, the Mayo Clinic, we all pretty much follow the same guidelines. We all have to take our boards. We all follow a standard. So these guidelines are relatively standard. Then you've got recommendations. Recommendations are something that probably is good to follow, but there's some data that says that you can actually deviate from that. And then you've got options. And options means that, well, the doctor has an option of doing surgery, or has an option of doing radiation therapy, and that really is the doctor's choice because he has some sort of reason that for that patient, it's a better way to go. Well, when it comes to looking at what we do for active surveillance, I don't always follow the AUA guidelines. I don't always follow the AUA recommendations because I don't want to biopsy a patient every year all the time. I don't think they need it. And in my practice, sometimes I biopsy a patient once every two years. And the reason why I biopsy the patient is that even though my finger doesn't feel anything, sometimes the prostate cancer can spread within the prostate gland. And if it's spreading within the prostate gland, it raises a red flag for me. It's going to make me want to follow that patient closer and certainly counsel that patient and tell them, well, it looks like your prostate cancer is progressing. We still have it localized. We still have the option of this therapy. So you may want to consider this rather than waiting longer. And so I don't always do that unless I feel that, you know, the patient merits a biopsy for other reasons. And that always depends on the individual private file and private, their, their own clinical status. I worry about biopsies. I don't want you to be one of those three or four people a year that winds up going to the hospital or taking you off your blood thinner so you have a potential heart attack or you have bleeding after the biopsy. So I'm not necessarily going to follow their recommendations. I'm going to be a little bit more conservative because when we do biopsies, we're doing them for the right reason, at least in our practice I feel we are. You know, we're very busy in Plattsburgh. We don't need to do work that we don't need to do. If somebody wants to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering and get taken care of with the prostate cancer, believe me, we've got other people that get separated. Many of you in the office know we're pretty busy in the office. So we don't do anything in my practice that I don't feel it's an indication to do. Some older men with low-grade prostate cancer may report a, a better quality of life. It's not just for old men. You've got young men with active surveillance. You know, it doesn't have to be. I believe in lead time bias. I've got data to show that. I mean, the people in the AUA and the American Board of Urology can sit me down, we'll talk. <laughs> but I don't really care what they say, because I've got science. You know, they go by science, but we, we are able to make our own clinical decisions. And if I've got a young man that I found a prostate cancer for the wrong reason, then I'm going to follow him, because I'm not going to give him potential for impotence and incontinence in their 50s or early 60s, or, or even if they're in their 70s. But I will follow young people with active surveillance. I don't have a problem with that. And they don't have to have a life expectancy of less than 10 years. Like I said, I don't agree with all these slides. I'm going to look after my patient, and I'm going to try to give him the best quality of life, because that's what we're supposed to do. I'll take a risk. I'll sit down with my patient and say, these are what the risks. If you're willing to accept the risks, so am I. But I think that that's the important thing to do. The most important thing is to counsel the patient. We have to be partners in making these decisions. So there's also something about, do you know anything about increased erectile dysfunction with more biopsies? We've done quite a few biopsies. I don't know if anybody's had problems with it. You know, there's something that we all have to understand. Typically, if we've got heart disease and we've got atherosclerosis, and I guarantee you half the people out there are taking pills for cholesterol, we're going to get hardening of the arteries. And if we get hardening of the arteries, we don't get hardening of that other thing. And it's going to happen over time. So the fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that impetus and erectile dysfunction can be natural progression of vascular disease. It's not the biopsies. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the surgery. It doesn't necessarily have to be the radiation. It doesn't necessarily have to be in your head. But it's part of physiology. And so we have to accept that it's part of the 
of a disease process as part of our society. Okay, let's compare external beam radiation therapy to brachytherapy. External beam, as I said, uses a computer and a CAT scan to target the cells. They say daily visits, it's going to be probably about 20 minutes to a half an hour, once a day, five days a week. Luckily, our, our uh, radiation oncologist is good. He only does it for seven weeks. I'd hate to be doing this for nine weeks. I think that's a lot. There's a lot of data that shows, and what they'll do is they decide on a dose. There's lots of data that shows the higher the dose of radiation, the more effective the cancer cure. On the other hand, the higher the dose of radiation, the more side effects there are and potential problems. One out of 20 individuals who get radiation therapy for the prostate, at least with some of the older data, will develop bladder cancer. It's a big number. We have lots of people getting radiation. One out of 20 will develop bladder cancer. So what are we doing? We're basically switching, curing one to get the other. And let me tell you, if I have my choice between prostate cancer and bladder cancer, prostate cancer, you've got lots of options for treating prostate cancer. Bladder cancer is a real killer, a real killer. Um, so, some healthy tissues are affected, the rectum, the bladder, the urethra, sometimes people can wind up with urethral strictures. That happens a lot more significantly with brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is a therapy that's been around since the 1960s. The only thing is that we didn't have a good ultrasound in the 1960s. Back in those days, we used to open up the belly, go down to the prostate, stick needles in, throw seeds through the needles, and then we go, we take an x-ray, and the seeds would be all over the place. I mean, they look like tiddlywinks in there. But with ultrasound now, and ultrasound guidance, and with the help of you guys, radiation oncologists, we have somebody here from radiation oncology, um, we can actually space those seeds very, very well. And we get a very, very good seed distribution which keeps that radiation localized. And so the risk of that radiation of harming the rectum, harming the blood, is significantly decreased. Unfortunately, with brachytherapy, it isn't really quite as effective as external beam radiation therapy. But in individuals that have well differentiated, moderately differentiated, and low bulk disease, it's very effective and it works very, very well. We're talking about this as an outpatient surgery, may require anesthesia. No one's sticking 30 needles into my butt without an anesthetic. <laughs> I'll tell you that right. Everybody gets an anesthetic, you don't get a choice. Everybody gets one. But I'll tell you, it can be a problem because many of my patients that want to get seeds, they're on blood thinners. And you've got to come off of those blood thinners because we can't stick 30 needles into your prostate and take them out and not expect to get some bleeding when you thin out that blood. So these are considerations that we have to think about every time we decide which way we're going with treatment for prostate cancer. Radiation therapy, sometimes you get some side effects that can be slow in coming. 10-year risk of death is uh, lower with surgery, but again, again, this is biased, okay? Because the individuals that we operate on are the healthiest individuals out there. Radiation is second. The hormones, oftentimes we use hormones for the infirm the real elderly, you know, I'm talking about people in their 90s and their 80s, people that are nursing home bound. But there's no doubt, surgery works and it works very well. I'm not proofing surgery, I am a surgeon. Now, this, uh, this has to deal with problems with urinary pain after radiation, 60% complaint of pain after two months. Our radiation oncologist must be good. You don't see that. We don't see that. Some individuals, I'm gonna say maybe, Maybe 30% they experience that for the first month. After the first month of radiation, they're doing pretty well. So I don't see this data. And as far as the surgery goes, I don't have any patients that have painful urination. Not one. Some of them leak. That's a bigger problem. But they don't complain of pain. Do you have anybody who really has painful urination? No. Okay. So I don't know where this slide came from. Anyway. Some of these are standard slides, but I'm going to give you my bias. It's, maybe we're just good in Plattsburgh. I don't know. So what's radical prostatectomy? The whole prostate's coming out. Not only the prostate, but the urethra inside the prostate and the seminal vessels. Because we want to go ahead and remove any tissue where that prostate cancer can spread. And that prostate cancer can spread to the seminal vessels. There's no doubt the data shows that the best way to cure prostate cancer is, is heads, heads up, 
with surgery by taking the whole prostate out. Now, that doesn't mean that surgery is always going to be effective and more effective than radiation therapy because at least 35% of the time we've understaged the patient. With T2 disease, when we have palpable disease, we often understage the patient, and if we don't go with wide margins, we can leave cancer behind. And we're not going to know until after we get the final specimen back. Radiation therapy, on the other hand, if they go with wide fields and wide portals, they can get those areas. I guess I'm ahead of myself. Not only can 35% of glands be understaged, but if you've got moderately differentiated disease that releases 3 plus 3 equals 6, one third of the time we'll actually find some 7, sometimes some 8 in there. It's unusual to have 9 and 10 if we don't find that in the initial biopsy. And oftentimes in the biopsy, we'll find maybe one or two cores. You take 12 cores in the biopsy, you might find one or two, maybe three cores, maybe just on one side. Over 52% of the time, it's bilateral disease. We typically will always find that there's more disease there that we didn't even know about. When we go, we take the prostate out, and the pathologist is able to go ahead and section that prostate and take a look at all the gland under the microscope. Which means that when we get all that gland out, we're doing a great job. And that's a good thing. So, what happens if the cancer returns? Well, that's what's good about prostate surgery, because when we do cryoablation or high food, high intensity frequency, or brachytherapy seeds, or we do external beam, we're not taking that prostate out. We're following that PSA. The digital rectal exam, throw it out the window, because you're going to get scarred, and it doesn't mean anything anymore. That's where that PSA is so important. We want that PSA to go down to nothing. But with radiation and with other therapies, we're we want to see it go down, but it goes down to what we call a nadir, as low as it'll go, and then it stops. When we see it going back up, we get concerned, because when we see it going back up, we're thinking, well, that prostate should be increasing, that PSA should be increasing, chances are there's still cancer there. When we take out the prostate gland, or prostate cancer, that PSA goes to zilch. So, again, these people in Washington, this lady from Baylor, that PSA is a great marker. It's a great marker because that PSA should go down to nothing. If I've got my patient who a couple of months or so after the prostate gland is out, after the surgery, if I see this PSA left over there, I worry. Doesn't mean the patient's going to die, but I know that somehow, even though the pathologist has told me my margins are negative, there's no lymph nodes involved, that PSA is telling me there's, there's some tissue somewhere that's got prostate tissue. Now, sometimes we can be fooled if we find maybe two years down the line or three years down in a little bit of a rise in PSA. Sometimes you can have some remnant glands which are in the urethra, and we get a little bit of PSA, and it just sort of sits there and doesn't do anything. That actually is not very worrisome. But if I get a PSA after surgery, and it's 0 0.08, now we've got very, very good PSA. We used to have a PSA. It could only go down to less than 0 0.05 nanograms per deciliter. Then we had a PSA that went down to 0.1 nanograms per deciliter. Now we get a PSA, a super sensitive PSA, that goes down to less than 0 0.1 and less than 0 0.01 nanograms per deciliter. If I see a patient that doesn't go down to 0 0.01 or less than 0 0.1 nanograms per deciliter two months after their surgery, I'm going to follow them closely. And if that PSA starts to go up, I know that there's cells beyond the area where I'm operating. I can't cut you in half. You know, you can't remove the whole. If I wanted to make sure there are no cells, I just cut you in half, put you in a wheelchair, and say, okay, well, your prostate cancer is gone. But that's not what we want to do. That's not what we can afford to do. Unfortunately, we have to go anatomically and remove the prostate from the prostatic bed. But we got to leave the muscle. You gotta leave the blood vessels, we gotta leave the major blood vessels going down to your legs. And within those lymph nodes, and there's always gonna be microscopic lymph nodes that are left, or tissue that's left, there might be microscopic cells that were not known to be there before. In other words, they were they were detected only through the PSA. And there's no way we could have known until we followed with the PSA. But that's where the surgery is so important in following the PSA after the surgery, because it allows us to really get an idea if there's any microscopic disease left over. But the good thing is, if there's microscopic disease, 
We've got other ways of taking care of it, and it's actually very, very effective. I guess I didn't even talk about this. PSA can fluctuate post-radiation. When, when people get radiation therapy, we look for this nadir, for this lowest PSA. Unfortunately, it can be something that's called a PSA bump. It's a documented where the PSA will go up. We all worry. We say, oh my gosh, uh, the radiation therapy didn't work. We follow it again. All of a sudden, it comes back down, and we get a big sigh of relief. It was just a PSA bump. We suffer through that with, uh, with radiation therapy because since the tissue is there, that PSA is not going to go down to nothing. We will follow the PSA to see if there's any cancer coming back. And even though there's cancer cells there, and there could be cancer cells there, again, with radiation therapy, we really don't care as long as the PSA remains low. Now, what surgery does is it gives us other treatment options, which we don't have with radiation therapy, because the fact is, is that if there's cells left over, if there's PSA left over after we move the prostate gland surgically, we can clean things up with radiation. You know, when the prostate gland was there, you know, we had the 82nd Airborne, and there's all these guys, parachutes falling down, there's cancer all over the place. But when we take the prostate out, there's just a few stragglers left over. And the radiation therapy can be very good for those stragglers. It's got 80-85% efficacy in treating the cancer and curing the cancer with what's called adjuvant, which means radiation therapy after the <coughs> prostate's removed. And it works very, very well. But what if the radiation doesn't work? Well? I mean, I've had patients that we remove the prostate, two years, three years later, the PSA comes back, we give them radiation, two or three years later, the PSA starts coming back. We give them some hormone therapy. Typically, at that point in time, the hormone therapy works very, very well. So I don't really have many patients that have needed more beyond that. But we actually have chemotherapy now. We actually have chemotherapy now for prostate cancer. Ten years ago, I couldn't have told you that. It's not the best thing in the world, but it does work some. And I couldn't tell that to my patients before. So we not only have the belt, we got the belt, we got the suspenders, we got second belts. We got more things we can do with the surgery than we have with other treatment plans. And if we get radiation, can we go backwards? Can we take the prostate out? Say, so, oh, the radiation didn't work. Let's take the prostate out. We could. 50% of people have holes in their rectums and wind up getting colostomies. 50% of individuals at that time will wind up being totally incontinent because what happens is the radiation therapy not only kills the bad cells in the prostate and the cancer, but it also it seals everything together. It scars. And what the scars do is it doesn't allow us to find the natural planes between the tissues. So when you're trying to get that prostate out, in a sense, you have to cut and chisel. You can't just peel the prostate away like we normally do before any radiation therapy. Now, when you chisel that prostate out, chances are you're going to leave some cancer cells behind, or you may put a hole in the rectum, or you may put a hole in one of the iliac vessels, possibly bleed to death in two minutes. It's a very, very dangerous operation, very tough to do. I've only done two in my career. And my first patient, I don't know about, he was at the VA. I was back in 1986, so I don't know what happened to him. But um, I did one patient in Plattsburgh, and we got him through it. And he did okay. He's now probably about six years out. But in the end, he still needed hormone therapy. I mean, we didn't, luckily, uh, you know, no problems with the rectum. We did well. It's only 50%. So 50% was on my side. This is an anecdote. It's not a study. It's my experience. But I will try to do everything I can, as most urologists will, not to operate on individuals who've had radiation therapy. Because not only can, can you cause big problems, but chances are you're not going to cure that cancer. Can those patients get hormonal therapy? Sure. And when we talk about hormonal therapy, we're not talking about giving them hormones. We're talking about taking the hormones away. Because 80 90% of prostate cancer cells are sensitive to testosterone. So that's what we talk about talk about hormone therapy. Now, let's talk about minimally invasive sur surgery. As I said, when we operate on individuals, we've got all different options on what kind of surgery we can do. And nowadays, nobody wants to get incisions anymore. I don't blame them. And I don't want to get an incision either. So laparoscopy is everywhere. Gynecologists do laparoscopy. General surgeons do laparoscopy. Urologists do laparoscopy. I'm taking out a kidney laparoscopically tomorrow, just a few hours, um, which means we're not going to be here too late, I hope. But it, it's minimally invasive, and not having incisions allows us to heal quicker because it's less pain. We cut through muscle 
it hurts. When we put poke holes in muscle, it seals up. It's not that bad. The robot's a great instrument. And when I go and I present to my patients that they're robot candidates, because not everyone's a robot candidate. I mean, individuals have to be healthy. They have to have good hearts. They can't be on blood thinners. They can't be on Plavix. They can't be on Pradaxa. They can't be on Coumadin. They can't have back problems. There's patients who have robotic surgery for the prostate have to be at a 45 degree angle for a few hours while I'm operating because when I go in through their tummy, the bowel has to fall out of the way in order to give me a surgical feel. So they have to be very, very healthy patients, but it's a very, very good operation. What are the potential benefits? Where's Seth? My incisions were never that big, Seth. I want you to know that, okay? They're a lot smaller than that. But this is. I guess the typical incision for what's called a retropubic prostatectomy. The, the pubic bone is here. The prostate actually lies behind the pubic bone. So we actually open this area, go behind the pubic bone in order to remove the prostate. Instead of making one big long incision, we actually make poke holes. These are called port sites, which is the way that we go ahead and insert cameras and we insert the robotic arms that help us to remove the prostate with the robot. And I've got someone here from a robotic team. Tonight. Good to see you. It's a great, uh, it's a great, 1.75 million dollar machine. And I'll tell you, when I work with this machine, I, I feel like a fighter pilot because we actually sit behind a console. This is the robot. It sort of looks like a scorpion or an octopus with all these different arms. And we've got these poke holes, and this is what the little arms look like. This is magnified. We're looking in, and I'm looking in through binoculars. We've got stereoscopic vision. It's high, high definition. And the movements that the robotic arms can do, my wrist can't. I can go around in circles. I can operate in small spaces. I've got tenfold magnification. It's a great instrument if you're a good candidate for the, uh, for, for the robot. 3D high definition. I see tenfold zoom. I can go in and I can see nerves that normally I wouldn't see unless I have to wear magnification. And we can wear magnification in the operating room. And I used to do that, but sometimes it, it can be very dangerous because you don't see what other things are in the field. Um, they are tiny instruments. I, I mean, this is tenfold magnified. I can hold a, uh, and you see me shaking with this? There's no hand tremor with the robot. The computer settles all these hand tremors down. I'm typically pretty steady. But when you go with very, very fine motor movements, you can't help it. You're going to have a small amount of tremor. And when I'm working around blood vessels and I'm working around nerves, the robot is very, very effective. It's very, very helpful. It lets me work with better dexterity, provision, not just for nerve sparing. Not everyone's a candidate for nerve sparing. We talk about nerve sparing surgery. We want to preserve the nerves because oftentimes that will allow many individuals, up to 70% when both nerves are preserved, statistically speaking, to get their potency back if they're good candidates. But not everyone should have nerve sparing surgery because unfortunately, so I often have the conversation about nerve sparing surgery versus prostate cancer surgery. Meaning that if I spare your nerves, you're taking a chance that we may have cancer that spreads through that nerve. Often what we do with the biopsy, the biopsy will say perineural invasion. Which means that cancer is always spreading through the nerves. It doesn't mean it made it out from the prostate cancer into those nerves, but there's a potential for that. So I have to discuss that with my patient. They want me to go ahead and preserve the nerves? I can preserve the nerves. No guarantee you're going to be potent if we preserve the nerves. It doesn't matter. You can be balanced. It doesn't matter. Everyone's different. And what's different about nerve preservation with surgery versus maintaining potency with radiation therapy is that with radiation therapy, you lose your potency over time as, as that vascularity in the blood supply dies and tissue dies. It's the other way with the robot. You get your potency back over time as the nerves tend to heal and improve from the manipulation you did during the surgery. My patients. Could have potency anywhere from the best I've had is six months 
after the surgery, typically three years is about the average when they start coming back to the point where they can actually have effective intercourse. <coughs> yeah. All surgeries have risk. Everything has risk. You get to a car, you have risk. You may have an accident. That's why we have insurance. Unfortunately, you know, things happen and bad things happen. Luckily, bad things happen in very, very low statistic volumes, very, very low statistic incidents. But if you're that statistic, it's a bad thing. Unfortunately, there's no way around that because we are all statistics. We're in this room. We could have an earthquake. We could have a fire. We could all be statistics. But you have to be willing to accept those statistics. The robot has its issues. Open surgery has its issues. I usually sit with my patient. I explain one versus the other. And uh, then they go home. They do some, some research on the web. They come back with their wives. We talk about it again. And by the time they leave, we've decided you're going to have the robot. You're going to have open surgery. You're going to have nerve sparing, one nerve, both nerves, no nerves. Um, and we've made those decisions by the time we're going into surgery. Uh, Again, Da Vinci system, not everyone is, is right. There's no guarantees of outcomes. It is minimally invasive. But as far as the outcomes go, we just go back. As far as the outcomes go, open surgery can be very good as well. I will tell you that in my experience, the blood loss with the robot is significantly less. It doesn't mean that with open surgery I do more transfusions because I do very few transfusions with open surgery. But I will tell you that when you go home with the robot, you're going to go home less anemic and you're going to have more energy. And we don't typically transfuse because we've got a lot of extra blood, so we're willing to accept some blood loss through some operations. With the robot, I really don't have any blood loss. And that is fantastic. Um, the people who have robotic surgery, because of the port sites and laparoscopic surgery rather than incision, We'll get back to normal activity quicker. There's no doubt because I don't have to worry about hernias. I do have to take one of those port sites and increase a little bit so that I can get the prostate out. That's a very, very small incision. It really isn't very tender. People can get back to heavy lifting a lot sooner and get back to work a lot sooner. But regardless, whether you have the robotic surgery, perineal open, rad radical pubic open, laparoscopic prostatectomy without the robot, everybody gets a catheter. Because when we remove the prostate and there's nothing sitting there between the urethra and the bladder, we can't let you pee into your belly. So we have to sew things together. And the catheter allows healing of that anastomosis. With the robot, we're able to do a continuous anastomosis. We're able to do like a knitting needle all, all along because we've got great dexterity. We don't have the ability to do that with open surgery. So we get a much more watertight anastomosis with the robotic surgery. Does it mean that watertight is necessarily better? I can't tell you it, it, it does, but it definitely looks good when you're doing the operation. It looks very, very nice. Um, the robot's a great instrument. It's here to stay. Uh, when I told, uh, I had a meeting with Mr. Mundy, who's our, uh, our CEO at the hospital three years ago, I said, you need to get the robot or we're not going to do prostate surgery anymore. Because a lot of what happens in medicine today is patient-driven. You know, you guys are in the driver's seat. You have options. You're not going to tell me what to do, and I'm going to give you your options, but you do have options, and you've got choices. And if the choice is that you want to have robotic surgery, if we don't have it here in Plattsburgh, you'll have it over in Burlington, you'll have it in Saratoga, you'll go down to Albany where they've got two robots, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Henry Ford. They've got more robots around this country than I know. And the fact of the matter is, Right now, we've got so many people trained with the robot at CVPH, just like I predicted. Don't, don't, don't get too thrilled about this. We need another robot. We need another robot. Because I can't get my patients to surgery on time. And now we're all competing for this robot because everybody wants to have robotic surgery. I'm not the only guy doing robotic surgery. <coughs> Dr. Grafstein does robotic surgery. Dr. Larson does robotic surgery. We now have two other gynecologists doing robotic surgery. We've got general surgeons that are training on the robot. And it's a good way to go. It's a very expensive piece of machinery. But if you guys are going to get what you want, we're going to have to get another robot. Because otherwise, you're not going to have the patience to wait to have your surgery done. But I got bad news for you. They're not doing any better in Burlington. They only got one robot. There's, lots of, there's a lot more people using that robot there. There's two robots in Albany right now. There's one over at St. Peter's, one in Albany Med. There's lots of people using the robot there. 
If you want to go down to Hackensack Hospital in New Jersey, they've got five robots there. If you want to go to Henry Ford, where a lot of the robotic surgery started at the Penny Institute, I think that they've got five robots. I was just at the Mayo at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. I think they've got five or six robots, all different kinds of robots. But you've also got 40 urologists there alone, so it's pretty competitive as well. Um, we're going to have to keep up with our technology. Yeah. What you need to know is know your personal risk factors. You got to talk to your family. You got to make decisions. They're going to help you get through this thing. And when you talk to your family, come in with your family. Oftentimes, I have a whole crowd when I talk to my patients about their prostate cancer before they decide on their surgery. You should talk to your doctor about prostate cancer screening. Think about it. You know, make good decisions. I'm going to give you some websites which there's no commercials. There's nobody from the government saying, hey, we're going to save some money because you don't need screening, which is what I think it's all about. Same with breast cancer, by the way. Discuss everything with your doctor. Go through your options. Hopefully today you'll have learned some things. And I'm going to give you some, some resources that you can learn even more on your own in terms of prostate cancer screening and tre treatment strategies. This is pretty much the algorithm. I'm not even going to go through it. That Dr. Grassi and I have to go through every time I see a patient who needs a digital rectal exam and is there for the yearly exam. It's just that simple. And before you guys walk into my office, I've already gone through this. I'm sitting there on the computer. I'm looking at the CVPH website. I've got your PSA. I've got what your chem profile 7 is. I've got what your PSAs have been over the past few years. I'm looking at your trends. And while you guys are sitting there in the room thinking, what the heck is that Dr. Greenberg doing? I'm, saying, I'm already working on it. And by the time I get in there in that room, I've got all the information I need. And I might only spend, you know, five or ten minutes in there, but I've already been spending about 15 minutes looking through all that information. So I just beg you to have patience because we need to have all that information in order to make the right decisions. Now, I've actually got some handouts that you guys can get, and ladies. So you can look get up on the web. This is actually one of the government, uh, this is from NCI National Cancer Institutes. This is our AUA website for patients. You can actually get on also www.auanet.org, which is the American Neurological Association. And there is a patient thing that you can actually get to the very sites I do. Look at our guidelines, look at our recommendations, look at our options. Look at the very things that I use to try to make my decisions that would help me to pass my boards last year. Um, and this is uh, from the American Foundation of Urologic Disease, National Institutes of Health. And I want to thank you very much. You've been very, very patient with me. I know I've taken maybe a little bit more time. And um, thank you. I'm going to let you moderate for me, OK? Can you just? Sure. Yeah. Because we're also going to have people calling in from the web, right? Right. I got that if anybody says that. Okay. Yes. Yes, as you were discussing uh, symptoms, I was writing something down and I kind of lost track of what you were saying as I was writing, but I thought I heard you say something to the effect uh, uh, if you have these symptoms, it's too late. Uh, something it like often that. is. I'm sorry? It often is. What, what, what do you want to treat what, prostate what? cancer when it's localized? When you have symptoms, you uh, referring to uh, Take care of it. In terms of symptoms? Yes. Uh, yes. Pretty much all those symptoms. Any of those symptoms, whether you have bleeding, painful ejaculation, painful urination, they're typically not associated with prostate cancer until the prostate cancer is no longer localized. I have uh, I have arthritis, and I'm going to have a hip. Uh -huh. I've already had a, a knee replacement. Yeah. And Are you uh, I'm experiencing the you know the groin pain, you know, and uh, I was my doctor said it was in that was causing the hip pain, uh, the hip deterioration. It's causing the groin pain, and I have back pain. At Which could level. also be causing the groin pain because that, that yeah. might be compressing some of your nerves. It's the iliotibial nerve which comes down. I can't tell you how many times we get people come in with testicular pain, and their testicles are absolutely fine. You know, you got to realize if I if I went and just took the top of your skull off, stuck a needle in there, I could make your toe hurt. Everything. And, and many women who've had epidurals, you know that when they give you the epidural, where do you feel that? Oh, I feel it in my toe, but they're sticking into your back. Our nerves, our nerves go everywhere, and they all start out in the brain, but then they move to the back. And if you've got something that's going on in your back, you can have recurrent pain at the very, very end of that nerve. I can't tell you whether your groin issues have to do with your hip and with your position, because when you have hip problems, you also don't walk exactly as you should, because 
can only walk with a little bit of a guarded gait. That could affect your back and turn. It's all related. But I, know, I can't tell you necessarily it's got anything to do with your prostate. As far as what, what may have to do with your prostate is if you want to go to the bathroom and you sit there and you're all of a you need to go, and you walked in and you need to go, and all of a sudden you're going, come on now, come on now. I mean, that typically is a prostate problem. But if you have back problems, it also could be that your bladder, the nerves going to the bladder aren't working as effectively. And, uh, you know, you should have your surgery. When you get all done, you're back, you know, come on and see us. We'll figure out what's going on. Well, I know I have I have a prostate problem, too. Well, you may very well have. And, you know, and, and your, your primary care doctor is taking care of that, or is it Dr. Banco or Dr. Grastein? Or? No, I have a senior allergist. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. He's right. Well, you know, get in and see us. We'll get you. Anyway, we'll be glad to see you and talk more about it individually. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the importance of the visual exam. Uh, what is the frequency and how important is it there as far as the condition of the you know, That's a great question. Uh, skill, you know, different skills in terms of. Yes. Yeah. I, you know. What was the question? The question is, how, what's the importance of the digital rectal exam, and how important is the experience of the clinician doing it? It's, it's a very, very good question. And I'll tell you, um, first of all, statistically for me, and, and I think it actually meets the, the statistics in the literature, 10% of the cancers I find, I find with normal PSAs and on digital rectal examination. And, and the way that we find it is that the prostate typically should feel soft like the tip of your nose. Don't go feeling your prostate. <laughs> and it's, it's not like that hasn't happened, believe me. I, my patients, I've had one patient said, gee, doc, I didn't feel like that last time. I didn't know what to say at that point. In time. But the thing is, um, I, I really think that it has to be the comfort of the individual. Now, if, if a primary care provider, because we don't have just primary care physicians anymore, we've got nurse practitioners, we've got PAs, we've got a lot of people doing these things that, um, that may not have the experience that you feel comfortable with. They should have the wherewithal to say, gee, you know, I'm not really sure what I'm feeling is right. And if they don't feel comfortable with their exam, they should refer you to us and we'll check it. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients referred because of questionable digital rectal examinations that I thought were just fine. And so I write back to the referring individual and said, look, you know, thank you very much for sending the patient, but I think everything's fine. Check about another six months or a year, depending on what, what the exam has been in the past. And I've had many patients referred for positive digital rectal exams, but they found cancers. And I agree with them, and they were cancers. So, you know, you should talk that over with your doctor. We have to have a little bit more of a thick skin these days as physicians. Okay, we have to have a thick skin. You know, we're not gods, and everything that we say is not taken as written in stone. You know, I've got lots of patients come into my office, very, very savvy. You guys have been on the internet, you've done your research, sometimes too much. You know, you come in and I can learn a lot from you, but sometimes I'm going to say, look, that's just, I just don't agree with you, and then we can part our ways. Um, but, but the thing is, you have to get that confidence with your provider and say, well, what do you think? Uh, did you feel comfortable with the exam? If they say they felt comfortable, if they start to get a little nervous, well, I know. And they say, well, would you like me to refer you to a urologist? Because if you do, I will. Go see the urologist. Because they don't feel comfortable with the exam. Greg. Uh, first of all, thank you to you and your staff and associates. We see the patients very informative. Uh, my question is, if you proceed to a progress to having your prostate removed, what is that going to do to change? What is that going to change in my lifestyle? What are the side effects of having the prostate removed? Well, there's no doubt that the two, the two most common thought about side effects are that of incontinence and incontinence. Let's go with incontinence first, okay? Um, the prostate has muscle, and the prostate actually sits below the bladder neck, and is part of our continence mechanism. You know, I think anybody that tells a patient that you're going to have your prostate removed, and you're going to be good as new without any problems, is not really being honest with the patient. Okay? Um, I think... For the, and, and I have had patients that have felt, look, Doc, I'm just as good as I was. I don't know that they're being honest with me. I really don't. But they're happy. And so if they're happy, they're not wearing pads, they can do whatever they want, I'm happy. On the other hand, I find that people are really fairly realistic. Um, you know, if they find that they 
are able to do whatever they want. Um, they don't need pads. Uh, or they need pads when they feel like, boy, you know, I'm insecure, I'm going to be out in public, and I might sneeze, I might laugh, I might cough, and I might drip a little bit, and I don't want that to soak through my pants. So I wear just a little bit of pad or I put a tissue paper down there. You know, people figure out a way to get by, but I will tell you that's the most common thing in terms of the Congress. Do people really need to be wearing these big, you know, it depends, diapers? Typically not. That happens in less than 3% of the cases, but if it does happen, we've got other options. I mean, we've got injections, we've got slings, we can even put in a sphincter that will make you continent, and it's totally on the inside. It's a prosthesis. It's an outpatient <coughs> procedure. But we can cure you that. It just it just means that you have to be willing to go through the operation and go through the recovery. Now, similarly, as far as potency goes, excuse me a second. I don't think anybody's going to do the same amount of surgery. I don't think you're going to do the same amount of surgery. I mean, <coughs> we've got lots of different toys. And <coughs> I think that there are some people that want to say, <coughs> this is my personal opinion. I'm as good as I was beforehand. <clears throat> I think that that's rare and far between. Do I think that people are able, certain individuals that <clears throat> are not smokers, don't have significant atherovascular disease, um, <clears throat> or not that old, they've had no problems with erections before the surgery, will they be able to have an adequate, good enough erection where they can have a climax? And by the way, <clears throat> if you lose your prostate, you can have a climax, but you'll never have ejaculation again. Because 30% of the ejaculate comes from the prostate, 25% actually comes from the prostate, and 70% come from the seminal vesicles. And guess what? They're gone. But it doesn't mean you can't have a climax. <clears throat> it's different. But there's little doubt that a climax in a man is one of the most satisfying things you have in your whole life. And it may not be the same, but it's still darn good. And that's what I've been told. <clears throat> I hope I never have to experience it, but my PSA is up a little bit. It's not terrible. But we all, you know, we all put our pants on the same way. I'm a patient just like you guys. I have to go through the same things. I have to consider what the different options are for me. And I've thought about these things. <clears throat> I've thought about the incontinence. I've thought about the impotence. I've got a wonderful wife. I'd like to be available for her until the day I'm six feet under. But <clears throat> If I get prostate cancer and I'm six feet under, I'm not going to serve her any good either. So the thing is also about impotence. We've got so many things. It's not, we're not, I'm not talking about Viagra. I'm not talking about Cialis. But there's injection therapy. There's external devices. There's new suppositories. There are different things that we can do to bypass if you've got injury with the nerves and aren't able to achieve erections. And <clears throat> last of all, we also have a prosthesis. And it's great. I mean, we call it the erector set, and it works, and it works really good. And it's totally internalized, and I've got it. I had one patient named the Bubba. He's very happy. <laughs> and um, it, uh, it works very, very well. Needless to say, the surgery can have complications. Those are the major complications. And there can also be rectal injury. There can be bowel injury, especially bowel injury with uh, laparoscopic surgery. There can be vascular injury. Um, with the uh, with the robot, you, there could be neurologic injury because of the positioning, where you may get some tingling in the fingers. That typically tends to go away. Any laparoscopic surgery where we use carbon dioxide, they, you can get shoulder pain, which comes from the carbon dioxide and from irritation of the phrenic nerve underneath the diaphragm. Um, most of the complications are short-lived. Most of them will recover significantly, including potency and incontinence to a certain extent, but. I think I'd be reticent to say you're going to be as good as new, but I, I can tell you that you're probably going to be cancer-free. And if, if you're getting treated for the right reason, we can't miss the forest and the trees. And I just can't say that more, more significantly. I mean, I, I've now been here for 21 years. I'm starting to discharge my patients that have operated in the early 1990s because they're well over 15 years out with PSAs of less than 0 0.01, and they're getting up into their upper 70s. And, at that point in time, if their cancer comes back with microscopic disease, they're, they're going to get struck by lightning before they die from prostate cancer. And I can be very proud to say that I saved that patient from prostate cancer. And um, 
You know, there's many people that die from cancers that just don't have a hope and don't have a chance. Prostate cancer is the second leading killer in this country next to men, next to lung cancer. So we can't, I don't care what anybody says, because I've got to look at my patients in the eye, and I'll get them digressing here a little bit. But I've got to look at my patient in the eyes when I say, look, you know, I'm going to do everything I can. You're going to be, you know, going to be. but in my heart, I know when a patient's going to die. I'm going to lose three or four patients this year because they got to me too late. So what I'm trying to say is there are some side effects, but first you've got to live. Yes? He still likes you. Just that he don't want to be. I don't care for the particular case unless something happens to make it easier. Right. But as a PSA, at my age, I've said before that I would go see him or you. No, you can see Dr. Baker. But 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 the thing is, you know. Even though we're three urologists and we, we typically have the same philosophy, some things are different, you know? Uh, I, I feel guilty seeing a patient charge me for an office visit when I think that they're really okay, you know? I, I do. I mean, I, I've got patients out there that really need help. And so I try to open up my slots in the office to get patients in the office that really need to get to be seen. And probably Dr. Bango feels the same way. Should you get a PSA? You're 74, you're young. I, I get a PSA until I'm 80 and then forget about it. But if your PSA is less than 0 0.01 and you're 15 years out, you're cured. You're cured of your cancer. I don't know what your numbers are. But sooner or later, we have to believe that you're cured. And if you are, you're a lucky man. What's that? I say, I'll probably live until I'm 95. You probably will, thank God. Well, I don't, I, again, I don't know your numbers. You know, you're welcome to call the office, and Dr. Banco can give you a call and talk to you about it, uh, and, and he'll do that. Okay? You're welcome. Sir? And you mentioned a couple times uh, you referenced a condition in Washington, I guess. So what yeah. Is, what's that about? Or you seem like not happy with it. I'm not. I'm not, because I think people are going to die because of recommendations that you shouldn't screen for prostate cancer because of PSA. And we don't screen for prostate cancer with just PSA. PSA is only one thing that we use. And before PSA, we were losing 50,000 people per year. You just saw, we're down to 29,000. I mean, what's going on? We're diagnosing more cancer. People are growing older. So how the heck can they say that we shouldn't go ahead and screen people for prostate cancer because we're worried about their getting damaged from having surgery or having radiation. I mean, don't get your appendix out. It's going to hurt. You know? Don't get your hips taken care of. It's going to hurt. Who's actually saying it? Is it about funding the, the test? Or no, I don't think it's about funding. I, I really think it's about it's about health care. I, I really think we're getting to the point in healthcare that we're going to try to do some rationing. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think, I think it's very short-sighted. Because I'm going to tell you, the gentleman that just left, who had his prostate taken care of, after his surgery, he did fine. He had to be seen. I follow my patients every six months for the first three years, and I get a PSA once a year. It's a five-minute office visit. I think we get paid $35 for a five-minute office visit, ten minutes, anything under 15 minutes. I mean, it's not much. And yet, if that man developed cancer now at age 74, it would take them five years to die from that prostate cancer, typically. They'll have all these symptoms. They'll have bleeding. Forget the ejaculation. They won't be able to get it up. This prostate cancer is going to go up inside the penis and the urethra. Because he needed to have a tube put inside his bladder. When that blocks off his kidneys, he's going to have a tube put in his kidneys. He's going to be in the emergency room probably once a month, being taken care of by home health care. We're going to get called every day. This is what we see with progressive prostate cancer. When I'm telling you, I've got my three patients that are going to pass. Luckily, two of them had their prostates removed, so they're not going to get obstructed, but they're going to die from distant disease. 
and it's going to be ready. It's going to be oncologists taking care of them all the time. But these patients now, because their prostate cancers were caught with localized cancer, are getting these chemotherapies and experimental this and that. Do you realize? Do you realize the tens of thousands of dollars that are being spent to try to save these patients, rather than doing one prostate cancer operation and being done with it? Our reimbursement for an operation If I told you we got reimbursement operation, you'd really be sick. It's nothing. It's not how we make our living. But but to take care of these patients with the healthcare system spends in helping these patients to to be comfortable in their dying years, it's incredible. And you can't just ignore these people. I mean they're in pain, they're suffering. Yes. How often should you get a PSA test or a digital exam? Once a year. Once a year? Once a year. Unless your doctor feels you need to get it for any other reason. As a screening, just once a year. Once you're 80, did your rectal exam, no PSA. And the reason why that is, is I don't care if you've got prostate cancer. I care if I can feel the prostate cancer. If you've got prostate cancer and it's sitting there inside the prostate not doing anything, who cares? But if I can feel it, then I get concerned that there's a chance that it could spread. Then I might follow it still, but I'll follow the PSA. I'll follow. So it, it all depends on what we find, but just once a year is all you need. Okay, sir? Yeah. Um, besides an annual screening, do you have like a top five things to help prevent prostate cancer, diet, or lifestyle? Yes, yeah. yeah. Ex exercise, decrease your cholesterol, fatty diet, and um, excuse me, like I say, like a piece. Get those tomatoes, they're good. Very good. Yes. I, I could actually be a, a poster child of PSA because I didn't have one of those symptoms that you want to diagnose with the cancer that was strictly because of the PSA is a good spine. That's exactly right. And, and, and there's no doubt that PSA saves lives. Is there a relationship between EPA's design of the prostate and the probability of not for prostate cancer, not for what we call adenocarcinoma. There can be, if you've got chronic inflammation, you can develop other cancers, small cell and squamous cell carcinoma, very, very bad cancers. But those are inflammatory changes. Um, and they're very, very rare. They're very, very rare. But BPH is, is, a, is a condition, and it's a lot more common than prostate cancer. I mean, one out of three men are going to have to have their prostate treated by the time they turn 90. It's a lot more than one out of six. That's 30%, or 33%. So, but, but you know it's a it's a it's an important condition. How do you determine when it is significant? You mean as far as the prostate? Yeah. When it causes you problems. I've had people that have had basketball prostates not bothered by them, and people that have had small walnut prostates that think it's their worst enemy. It, it it really varies from individual to individual, and what we have to do is we have to determine who the individuals that need to be treated versus those that don't, and then how to treat them. That's, that's a whole other talk because there are many ways to go ahead and make a diagnosis of, of symptoms from benign and prostatic hyperplasia and then different treatment strategies, which I'd be glad to talk to you about in the office of May. Anyone else? Yes. At what age should your children be guarding if, if you've got prostate cancer and you've got numerous members in the family with prostate cancer, I'd start them in their mid thirties. Doesn't mean you're going to treat them, but I'd look. I lost a, and, and I don't. That's not a specific guideline that I've got anywhere. On, it's just that when I was uh, entering my residency in Cincinnati, my uh, my uh, real estate agent took me to the side. And said, He's only thirty-five. I'm having some bleeding. What do you think I should? And I wasn't even a urologist. I was a general surgeon. And do two years of general surgery before you can do urology. And so I said, yeah, I think you need to see a urologist. You just have some bleeding with urination. And actually, bleeding with urination is not commonly uh, prostate cancer. It's, it's typically infection or bladder cancer. So you have any blood in the urine, uh, there's other reasons why we should look for much more than prostate cancer. Uh, about a year later, I. I saw him in the hospital and took care of him before he died, about three days from prostate cancer. Broken back, 
couldn't move. Two kidneys were shut down, and Steve died. He was 37. God bless him. Any questions from the web? Not right now. No one's no, looking. Good. Any questions out in the audience? Well, then I guess we're going to call it a night. Then. We did have very good positive comments. That was a great presentation. Thank you very much, everybody. Careful driving home. Very good job.